Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our virtual Q&A for Nancy Kelly's Thousand Pieces of Gold. I'm Jesse Trussell, repertory and specialty film programmer for BAM in Brooklyn. A big thank you to our partners at Kina Lorber for working with us both on this virtual run and this event, and the team at Indie Collect for their amazing job on this restoration. We'll begin with some conversation between us, but we'll take some questions from the audience towards the end. So feel free to go ahead and start leaving those in the YouTube channel starting now. Um, we are thrilled tonight to be joined by the amazing members of the cast and crew of this film, including director Nancy Kelly, producer editor Kenji Yamamoto, writer Anne Makepeace, and the stars of the film, Rosalind Chow and Chris Cooper. Uh, everyone, would you like to introduce yourselves? Start with Nancy and Kenji. Hi, I'm Nancy. I'm Kenji. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I'm Rosalind. Anne. I'm Anne. Hi. I'm so happy to be with this amazing group. Hi, and Chris Cooper. Hi. One of the Again, actors. Thank, thank you all so much for, for joining us tonight for this. Uh, so Nancy and Kenji, I thought I'd begin with you. Uh, you've been working in documentaries for years leading up to this. So how long had you been thinking of making a narrative film, transitioning into narrative? Could you talk a little bit about that background and that move? You know, um, we hadn't been, it wasn't really like years. It was, um, I had made two documentary shorts. Um, so, and. I don't know what I, I wasn't thinking anything. Like I just read the novel when I was touring with um, with my documentary Cowgirls. And you know, when I read it, it was like, this is a narrative film. I want to direct it. I showed, yes. I yeah. showed it to Kenji, he was like, let's go. <laughs> so, and then, so I mean, you have a, some background as a cowgirl yourself, I think. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> So did that, was that really, really resonate with you when you were first reading the novel? Oh yeah, because I didn't, you know, I had spent all that time in the West. I'm not from, I'm from Massachusetts, so I, I, but I spent some years working on Cattle Ranch and I felt like I knew a lot about the West, right? But when I read that story, it was like, I didn't know about this, what happened to these Chinese women, these Chinese girls, these slaves, you know? I, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it and, um, and just the idea that, Walu was this woman who survived because most of them didn't. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just really wanted to tell that story. And so when did Anne come into the project as the, as the writer? And maybe you could sort of talk about like when you started to come into this story. So uh, Nancy and I have been friends for a while. We met at a, a film festival where we were both showing our first documentaries. That would have been 82, I guess. Um, so we knew each other at the time I was uh, working to become a feature director, uh, as Nancy did. I'd written my first script, was invited to the Sundance Lab, and I'd uh, gotten a wonderful cast, when I want a writer, Lucas Haas, Graham Greene, Michael Bauhaus to shoot it for free, and I never got it made. But I, so it was a very frustrating time for me in terms of my own uh, career. But um, Nancy and Kenji really liked that script that I had uh, developed at Sundance and um, brought me on board. And I had been watching, I mean, Nancy is such an incredible, incredibly determined person. So <laughs> I remember her telling me about this novel when we were both at the uh, Squaw Valley Community of Writers. I, I believe that was 1983. And she was gonna direct it. And then she did, it was unbelievable. So. Um, so that's when I came in. I guess uh, Nancy and Kenji hired me probably in 86 or, or 7, something like that. Um, and then we did a lot of research. I did, you know, we all did a lot of research and it was a, a whole world opening up, which is what I love about filmmaking. And uh, our first writing was on a houseboat in Sausalito, the three of us, where, where I got to stay and then they would come and we would put our heads together and go, how do we do this? How do we, what do we leave in? What do we take out? You know, so uh, the- And the, the original novel it sort of goes from the birth of Lalu all the way to the end of her life, sort of correct if I have that right. So how did you sort of decide which of the chapters, which that, that sort of section that is in the film to make that the heart of the story that you tell in the film version? Well, I think, you know, um, what they call the inciting incident is Lalu being sold and brought to America, you know? So we decided to start with that. 
and it's a love story. So we pretty much shaped it as a love story. I mean, at first it's kind of, it seems like it's going to be a love story with Dennis Dunn. Um, and then that becomes a heartbreaking love story. And then of course it becomes a beautiful love story with Charlie. So those were the things that were dramatic, that had heart, that had forward motion. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm sort of making it sound easy. Like, oh yeah, this is how, what we're gonna do. It, there was a lot of hashing out and uh, productive arguments. And um, I, it was hard. I remember the three of us wanted to tear our hair out uh, at, at various points, but um, I really, I began to hear their voices, I guess, as I was writing and as I was researching, I began to hear their voices. And it was fun seeing the film again because I don't know, I could hear those voices in my head from when I imagined them and there they were on screen. So, that, so, so that's how that all worked out. But the other thing that Anne um, is leaving out that she brought to the script was this theme of home. Yeah. That was, um, I mean, that, without a theme like that, a sort of touchstone theme, I don't think a film can really work. And, and you, you brought, that. You brought I, that. I, yes, I did. Because the story really, in addition to being a love story, was a story about, you know, when do you know that the place that you're in, rather than the place that you're longing for, is home? When do you know that? And um, I love that Lalu realizes that as she's leaving. And I think I called upon, you know, I'm a New Englander, but I lived in California for 30 years and was living there then. And I missed the smells and the seasons and everything about New England. So I could draw on them. Like, there's no comparison between, you know, gosh, I had to go to college in California and stay there. You know, but but I could but I could call on those feelings of of you know every fall I would long for home, and so yeah that in, that certainly informed the writing and I don't know when in what stage of the writing we started talking about that or when it came to me you know we're talking thirty what thirty two years ago yeah it does all come back well not all a lot of it comes back. Mm. Um, but Nancy and Kenji, uh, Anne mentioned Dennis Dunn in the film and the, between Rosalind and Chris and Dennis and Michael Paul Chan, there's, the cast is so incredible in this film. Some of the great Asian American actors of their generation and just from top to bottom, it's really incredible. Could you talk a little bit about the casting process and how you put this incredible ensemble together? Well, um, we, <laughs> so Thousand Musical was developed through the Sundance Institute and one of the great benefits of that was that Michelle Satter would introduce us to people and they um, set us up with Laura Kennedy, this fantastic casting director and she just knew everyone, you know? She brought Rosalind in, you know, the very first morning of the very first day of casting and, um, you know, that. Nobody ever, Rosalind's at the bar, and then we looked and looked and looked, and nobody ever, ever met that. And the, the first time I ever talked to Laura, we were in, we were having lunch, and before she even like sat down in the chair, she was like, Chris Cooper is Charlie. <laughs> you know, and um, it took us a while to get to New York and, um, and see him, but um, you know, there was no doubt that she was right. There was no doubt. And we knew about uh, Dennis Dunn's work at, at the Asian American Theater uh, in San Francisco and saw his performances and seen him in other movies. So it's like, you know, he's practically a neighbor. So let's just hop over to, to San Francisco and, and audition him. We auditioned other Asian American men, Chinese American men. And uh, we went to even, uh, we auditioned someone from Taipei, I believe. And um, so, we, we actually decided, well, Dennis is the one that we should have. And Michael Paul Chan was from Los Angeles. And uh, he I, we had never heard of him. We hadn't heard of but, him before. You know, I'm so glad. Aren't you guys glad? Wasn't he? Yeah, he was okay, wonderful. Great. He was wonderful. <laughs> one of the first things that uh, Michael Paul Chan did was, and this I remember when he came to the set, uh, uh -huh before we were in production and he put his, his arms around Chris and said, 
we ought to get to know each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> I never remember that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rosalind, I'd love to know what you thought when you first got this script and were, were sort of thinking about auditioning for this part and everything sort of, uh, yeah, what were you thinking about the, the project at the time? Oh gosh, well, this project was a dream come true basically because, you know, prior to this, you know, every job I auditioned and, and it was at, you know, pretty much the beginning, I was kind of a kid actor, but um, every part that came up, it was like, meh, not pretty enough. You know, it was always, that was always the, back then that was the first thing you couldn't get past the first step unless you were like, va, va, boom, you know? But um, Laura had seen me in uh, a play at the, one of the smaller theaters at the um, Mark Taper Forum. And I remember one of the other actors said, you know, I'm kind of friends with this casting director and she um, wants to know, have you ever done a film? And um, would you be interested in a low budget film? I was like, would I be interested? Oh my God, <laughs> it would be a dream come true. And when I read the script, I mean, I kept feeling like maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they sent it to the wrong person. This is too good for me. You know, <laughs> it was, it was, I, it, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. If you really want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Lalu is this just incredible three-dimensional complex role for an Asian American actress that it almost sort of looks forward to so many of the strides of representation that have come in the 20, 30 years since then. I mean, how did that feel for you at the time, be able to see this kind of like just extremely complex woman there on the page? Well, for me growing up, I, you know, I never, um, you know, they really skate over the Asian American experience um, in California school books, and, and they still are. Um, so to actually see this period in history, and I was a little obsessed with that growing up because, uh, you know, I grew up as an American and never really rarely saw myself reflected on screen or in magazines, or maybe I did, you know, new as journalists, but other than that, I really didn't see myself reflected. And so to be able to see a piece of history and to learn about Lalu, who's the first um, Asian American pioneer woman um, and her strength. I feel like I drew strength from playing her, to be honest. I feel like I became a different, I was a different person at the end of filming that movie. Did you do a lot of research historically into the condition of Asian women immigrants at that time and sort of the, the historical back background? How did, how did that process work for you of really digging into the character? Well, I had been obsessed with um, the gold rush and all that beforehand um, growing up. So that was um, definitely in my DNA. But um, as far as her spirit, you know, Nancy was so helpful. And I, you know, I was not the most experienced actor and um, Nancy had sent me, uh, you know, all the research that she had done and this book called Spirit of the Survivor. I've mentioned it before um, by Gail Sheehy. And we, we talked at great length about the concept of home and, you know, that really, um, that really touched something in me because I grew up with a mother who was always homesick. And I mean, she never came to that, the point at which Lalu comes to at the end, but um, she's still homesick. <laughs> but, um, that's, you know, that's a really, that was a really strong um, uh, touch point for me in the film. Chris, I'd love to turn to you now. How, what is your process like when you're digging into a character? Like when you had this screenplay, you were sort of reading about Charlie, how did you find your way into the script? Well, I think we were provided with the, what was the book? It was called Gold Mountain. Was the book called Gold Mountain or? Uh, no, it was called, but there was another book called Gold Mountain prior to that, I think. Well, I mean, we we're talking about them many years ago, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly read the read the book, and I and I had read uh, that he was a Civil War veteran, and you got to fill in the ideas. Okay, what is this wayward guy who's uh, drinking a lot, gambling? You know, you put together. So, uh, 
I surmise that he he had spent time in a prisoner of war camp during the Civil War. He was a Union soldier fighting against slavery. Um, and so that gave me a taste of, of possible his, you know, his, his history of PTSD, why he's self-medicating, why he's so aimless. Um, it all kind of fell together. Mm -hmm. You've made all sorts of films from set films set in the modern day to period films. You had made Lonesome Dove just shortly before making Thousand Pieces of Gold. Do you approach that those kinds of films, whether it's a period film or something set in the present differently? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, make this sweet and short. I've, I figured that you got three things. To, an actor has three things to work from, and that is historical research, if he's playing, fig, you know, figure, living, living or dead historical figures, and what can you bring to your character through your personal life experience? And my my life as a young man served me very very well in a lot of films, in a lot of westerns, and a lot of period pieces, present day pieces. I uh, I raised I raised uh, registered Hereford cattle with my father in the '60s and '70s, and um, almost considered doing that as a life you know as a life choice. Um, and thank God that I didn't because um, I realize it's such a physical life, and. Um, but it was something I really seriously considered, but I had to try this acting thing, see, you know, and make a go of it, or I'd, I'm quite sure I had a, I'd have been a really, really um, angry man if I didn't follow through with that. But it was a wonderful physical life, and it served me very, very well in a lot of films, um, having, having lived that, you know. Um, Rosalind and, and Chris as well, uh, I wonder if you either you have any sort of fun memories from the set or sort of things that really stick out from you from the shoot that you can recall that you'd love, to, you might be able to share. Well, I was just going to say, I had no idea that Chris had this background with cattle because I do remember our van getting stuck from the hotel to the set. And I think we were an hour late because the cattle were crossing I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but the cattle was moving really slowly across the road and we couldn't, you could have gotten out and gotten a set on time. Yeah, that was, that was a, like a very special particular day um, of celebration for the locals where they moved their cattle that day uh, as, I, as I remember it, but you know. No, I wasn't going to run somebody else's cattle and direct them. No. Um, we will probably come out to the audience for questions uh, in just a few minutes. So if you have any more, feel free to start leaving those in the chat. And we'll start getting to those shortly. Uh, Nancy and Kenji, turning back to you, um, the locations in the film are so gorgeous, That those beautiful Montana locations. Could you tell us a little bit about how you found where you shot uh, and just the experience of, sh of shooting outdoors in those amazing places? Well, we found the, the location by my looking in a magazine. I was at, in a hotel room, um, uh, avoiding my uh, my mother-in-law and her girlfriend as they were touristing in uh, Carmel, uh, searching for Clint Eastwood since he was the mayor of the town. He owned a restaurant and I said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So I was reading this magazine and here was this article about this restored Gold Rush Town in Montana, run by this eccentric congressman up in Montana who, who uh, had a, a real fanciful idea about creating this town. And he would find authentic 1880s Gold Rush buildings, take it all apart, number the logs, bring it to his property, and then he would build this town. And he was the uh, an heir, uh, an heir to the uh, what was it General Mills, right? 
I guess he didn't have any shortage of money. Yeah, he didn't have any shortage of money. But he even found that Chinatown. That was what was so remarkable. Right. Right. That he even found a Chinatown to bring to the um, to Nevada City. So we leased the town for three months uh, during pre-production and production, and um, we actually set it up like a um, old-fashioned studio shoot where the production office was right inside the buildings the editing suite, I can look out the window from editing and producing and see what was going on. And um, there it was. And a lot of the props were inside the buildings. So that was- The really dressing rooms were um, above the saloon. So yeah. we were, um, I mean, I was in an actual saloon dressing room getting the corset pulled and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The, there's the old line about never working with kids and animals. How was, with all the horses in the film, how was that going? How did that go? No, I mean, my take on it, which is unique, I think, to the set, maybe Sarah Green and I, because she was also an equestrian, but it was just kind of like, great, you know, these people, this is how they did it in the 1880s. They got from one place to another on horseback. So when they weren't using an ox cart and, you know, to me, it was just, normal i you know but what i the thing my big thing about the horses was that like the ones in china were supposed i mean there was a drought there was starvation and those horses had just had like the best winter of their lives they were like this they were obese practically but i don't think anyone else was bothered by that but <laughs> i didn't worry about that but you know i mean once the you know when the when the father puts lalu into the ox cart well, when we were waiting for that to shoot one of those takes, the ox ran away with the actresses <laughs> in it across the prairie, and it was all bumpy. And I, I just thought these the, these young women are just going to freak out. But they didn't. They all just sat there like, you know, we're actresses. We can handle anything. And I mean, a wrangler had to go galloping after the ox and turn it so that it would stop. You know, but. That, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that ox, like, we could have done with a more professional ox. <laughs> <laughs> it was an animal. <laughs> <laughs> the important lessons for young filmmakers, make sure you get the most professional ox available. Um, so we're going to go to some audience questions now. Um, our first question is from uh, Sarah Film. Uh, this is for Nancy and Kenji. What is it like to make a film and work together as uh, a creative partners and life partners? How does that work for the two of you? It helps if one of them is really a comedian and makes you laugh all the time. I mean, Kenji and I have a contest every morning to see who can tell the first good joke of the day. <laughs> he usually wins. <laughs> you know, we both had this interest in films and in art, in museums and plays. And often we'll maybe say, see something and we had this very lively conversation and we do work together. Um, as I explained once to someone, I feel like we're two dolphins in the sea and eventually we're in cadence with each other. And there's a wonderful thing when you work with a team member for a very long time, like Kurosawa would have the same cinematographer or the same actor and the conversation becomes less because it could be just a nod. But the other thing is there's this thing that Kenji does when we'll be in the edit room, we'll be talking about something and he'll go, you know, and when he does that, it's like, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm saying, it's like, I stop. I just want to keep it so often that is <laughs> something good is coming. That's good. The, the, all hands on deck, see what's happening now with, uh, with Kenji. Um, the next question is from Marla, uh, and this is for Nancy and Rosalind. Um, so Nancy, I'd love to know what it's like to direct in a foreign language, um, and would also love to hear from Rosalind in terms of working in Mandarin and being directed by Nancy and Kenji as well. So perhaps we could start from uh, Nancy, sort of directing in a language that's not your own. How is that? You know, do you remember what the what the script looked like that we shot from? There, it just looked like a regular script, but then there were the um, 
the, then it was in um, Mandarin on the side, right? I, written by hand, if I remember, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I mean, I always knew what was being said. You had learned from your mother. I right? learned, and, and Susie had um, uh, spelled out, because I don't read, I'm illiterate in Mandarin. And so she had spelled out uh, the, it's called pinging of um, Mandarin. And to be honest, my Mandarin's better now than it was then. But, um, uh, you know, yeah, it never seemed to be an issue, did it? No. I mean, when, when Rosalind came into audition, she, her mother had taught her one of the scenes was one of the Mandarin scenes and had, had you had learned from your mother the, the, the dialogue, right? And so she came in and, you know, said, I, you know, I want to do this in Mandarin, you know, mm -hmm. and Laura Kennedy were like, oh, no, no, that's okay. We don't, you know, and she kept saying, no, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. And Laura was like, when do I know when to talk? And uh, they try to work it out. Not, I'll nod. I'll look at you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, um, and it was so... What? The script says in Mandarin. So, I mean, you know, I think I should go for it. Um, but yes, I do oh. remember looking at me with, you know, saucer eyes. <laughs> that was always a, that was always a question that I had in mind that, that, that um, Rosalind and Dennis and Michael, I wondered if they were familiar with, with Mandarin. You know, be for in the in the casting of the characters. I mean, I my my first language was Shanghainese, which sounds nothing like Mandarin um, as a child. But I forgot it all by the time I was, um, you know, I think four years old. And so I never. I was born and raised here, so my script was really not great at the time. Um, and I think Dennis spoke Cantonese, right? Which is perfect for the character and Michael as well. Um, so I think they had more of a working knowledge, but I, I shouldn't answer for them. But I think they, they were a little more familiar with Cantonese. I mean, it wasn't something that, it wasn't like one of our requirements, like we can't cast this person if they don't speak Cantonese. Um, I, I don't remember even thinking about it until we got like, the dialect coach and people we really started grappling with how to deal with those scenes you know uh the next question is from amy and this is for nancy what advice would you give to your younger self perhaps you know what advice would you give back to that a woman making her first feature uh if you could today i don't know We'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked that? Um, <laughs> uh, the next question is for Kenji. Um, and this is sort of asking about, you've edited numerous documentaries over the years and editing a narrative. Or is there a difference in feeling when you're working on a narrative or a documentary in the editing room? Um, and How do you approach those differently? Well, there is a huge difference in that you're weaving together performances and it's not a single take that is the domineering performance. It's, it's really a collage. It, it is truly woven together. There's a moment when Lalu will say something and it's just one moment or one look. And you, of course you work with the director and you see if the, th that could actually eliminate dialogue because are they in love? Is she mad? Is he angry? And um, so it's quite different. Um, with documentaries, you're struggling so hard to make the content work together as a structure. You're given a script. We know the structure. Now the magic happens. It's how they perform and what is the most convincing performance, what part of the performance is working the most? Is there eye contact? Are they in love? Those are the things that I look for. And it's, of course, a real joy to work with wonderful actors and a wonderful script. 
Uh, the next question is from Charles, and this is uh, really for, for anyone who would like to address it. How do you feel the themes of the film resonate with the challenges that immigrant populations currently face in America? It's really sad that it really hasn't changed. And in fact, the, the, the reflection between what's going on today and the, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the, the whole attitude towards immigrants is just, um, I mean, it's, it's really horrifying to see that it is. I really think we never come back like this, this sort of anti-Asian sentiment. And, um, you know, I'm always optimistic when it starts to wane and, you know, the fact that Parasite had just won the Oscar and, you know, Crazy Rich Asians last year. And it just seemed like, you know, we were finally at the table accepted into Americans. You know, we didn't have to, we weren't still like, acting like we were outsiders, you know, we didn't feel like, we felt like part of the um, tapestry. And then this happened, you know, just calling it the Chinese virus. And there's no delineation between Americans and Chinese and what China did. And so, you know, it's, that feeling has come back, unfortunately. Um, of course, we're not, I mean, not to the extent that back in those days, um, but it's definitely here. We were talking a little bit earlier about the way that the film feels so ahead of its time, and maybe this is one of the ways that it's sadly ahead of its time of predicting that still these, these issues would be re recurring again and again. Um, and it's so one of the things that's so incredible, I think, about watching the film now is watching this film from 30 years ago that in many ways feels like it has so much to say to the current moment. Yes, it, I mean, even the fact of, of a white man with the Asian woman and that she really wants, I mean, it, it addresses so many of the issues that are uh, bubbling under, you know, our current situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Stanley. Uh, hey guys, greetings from New York City. How did the financing happen and what was the path to putting the financing together for the movie? Oh. A snap. <laughs> you know, I, this process of um, being involved with the, the re-release of the new restoration has it reminded me what my attitude was when, when we were raising the money. Because I felt like when we started, we were kind of looking at Hollywood for money. And, and my attitude was, I have already made it in a male dominated world. I became a cowgirl. I became what the cowboys called good help, right? And they did not think of me that way in the beginning. And so when I would go and meet with these people in Hollywood and they would, you know, say this or that, you know, like Chinese woman in the lead, forget it. I would just look at them and think, you're just the soft guy that sits at a desk all day. You couldn't rope a calf if you got paid mm. today. Mm -hmm. I'm out of here. And, you know, I mean, and that was a useful attitude because it took us six years to raise the money for this. And, um, and I stopped out of a lot of meetings mad, you know, and how blind people were. But the fact that we, I mean, we raised money from individual, in fact, finally, we were just like, forget Hollywood. And we started raising money from individuals in the Bay Area, from investors. And um, we had these investor parties with horrible wine and, you know, like grapes and stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, but we would, in the Bay Area, people were, you know, they, it wasn't ahead of its time for those people because it was like, oh yeah, you know, we're in. And um, except for the guy whose car was stolen, he, he wasn't in. <laughs> but, During a fundraiser, mind you. <laughs> right. But, you know, we, we were able with that money to be able to hire Ann and to, you know, like, scout for locations and and just kind of put together um like evidence with the script and just proof that we could could do it and then when we went to sundance the the draft of the end row after that then lindsey law and um lynn holst from american playhouse that's where they that that's when they made their commitment and um and that got us to about halfway to the budget and then we were just in these doldrums and Kenji kept saying, 
we got to find a maverick. We got to find a maverick. And then finally, you know, I was in LA and I went to the distributor of Cowgirls, one of my documentaries to Mitch Block and um, to pick up a check. And he came out and said, there's somebody in my office I want you to meet. And I just thought, well, I, you know, I'll meet anyone. And this guy, his company was called Maverick Productions. <laughs> he read the script over the weekend and um, that Monday invited us to Hong Kong to meet his, his production company partner. And, you know, then, we, then we had the money, you know? It was also, that time had such, there and still, but the, it was really the beginning of this incredible independent filmmaking community in America. And I know that this film shared some crew and also an incredible lead actor in Chris Cooper with a lot of John Sayles work at that time. Um, could you talk a little bit about that sort of like intermixing being a part of the independent film community at the time and maybe how you had some of that cross pollination with some of the, uh, the, the John Sayles cast and crew? Well, you know, John Sales was a real model for us uh, as far as how we would engage in making an independent film. And that is that you treat your crew well. And the story is very valuable to why everyone is gathered together. And um, we were very fortunate to, to uh, hire Sarah Green, our co-producer, who was then at that time uh, an assistant producer on John Sayles' film, Maywan. And she knew a lot of the other uh, crew members on that, on that team. And uh, uh, she introduced us to Dan Bishop, who was the art director. He was an assistant art director, I believe. And um, we hired him very quickly. And because he loved the script and he was very inventive about how to do things inexpensively and make it look real. And it was the spirit that the crew, when they were gathered together, how they were so enthusiastic to work together. We, she suggested, and we took it to heart, to have a daycare for the families. There were husbands and wives that came to the set and they needed to have some babysitters to take care of their children. And we embraced that idea. So it was truly a family gathering um, of which we understood that this was truly a, the independent filmmaking spirit. So. And, I mean, we were, uh, we considered ourselves as did Anne, part of that American independent film community. And, we were. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, next question from Amy, and I think there might be a little inside information here, but uh, Amy asks, uh, Uncle Kenji, did <laughs> Auntie Nancy ever get you to ride a horse while you guys were filming in the old West Mining Town? What? Uh, did uh, Kenji ever get on one of the horses while you guys were shooting the movie? Uh, I was a little too busy, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you did get dressed up to be an extra. Oh yes, there, there, was, a, there was a lack of uh, Asian extras, so. <laughs> and then my, my father and mother came up, my father is dressed up, and then my sister came up and her children, and they are in the film. <laughs> right, she's, she's the, the prostitute behind bars. And yes. Kenji <laughs> often said, I've always wanted to put her behind bars. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is from Helen and it's for Anne. Uh, was there any subplots uh, that you put in the movie that weren't in the book? And was there anything in the book that you wish you could have gotten into the script? I think one thing that I'm proud of that um, was a total invention that was not in the book was that uh, Charlie Hip was a Civil War veteran and um, that he had been in Andersonville. And because I had, it took me a while to understand and relate to the character of Charlie. I didn't quite get who he was. You know, he was, as Chris said, a drifter. Um, but, you know, the timing, it, the Civil War would have been 15 years, uh, 15 or 16 years before. So I was very present. Um, and also, I, it was not just Chris's character, it was, um, uh, what's the name of the guy, Nancy, that's really rough with Lalu in the, you know, that dances roughly with her and, he, and he's got a rebel oh, hat on, right? Right. Yes. right. Jimmy yeah. Scott, I forget so, the name of the character, but that was the actor. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, I mean, so, you know, those tensions between Southerners and, uh, and Northerners are, you know, that, that was something that I added to the script. Um, the, the other question was, what's missing? Is that what the other question was? Yeah, was there anything else that was in the novel that yeah. you wish you could have gotten in? The scene that I, that, I, I, that I hunger for when I see the film that is, was in my script and is not in the film, which is that when, um, when Dennis Dunn comes back and finds Lalu living with Charlie and thinks, of, co of course he thinks, you know, they're sleeping together. Um, there was a whole, I had written a whole scene of dialogue between Lalu and the Dennis Dunn character, spacing out on his name. Um, and that's one scene Jim. I did miss. But otherwise, I think, you know, Kenji talked earlier about um, in the editing, when you can see emotion, you can cut dialogue. And I'm all for that. You know, I think, I think there were a lot of really good choices to uh, cut things in the script. So I'm very happy with the movie, but that, that's one scene I miss. And, and the Civil War thing is, is one thing I'm proud of. One of the things. You I'm know, proud when, of. when Anne wrote that, that came in, you know, pretty late in the, you it know, did. it did. And when she came up with that idea, just like, it was such a great idea. I felt like I didn't know anything about war veterans and PTSD and stuff, but I had a friend who was a um, therapist who um, had counseled a lot of veterans, Vietnam veterans. So he agreed to, um, to talk to me and I drove up to his, 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 his therapy office. And I remember walking in thinking, I'm not messed up. I'm just here doing research. And there were people in the waiting room and my friend came out and he said, oh, it's a good thing you're here. You look very disturbed. <laughs> right. You know, when we, uh, when we were working on this, the Vietnam War was about as far, you know, as close to us as the Civil War was to um, the era in the film. So, uh, you know, I was very aware. I protested the, the, that war and, and um, uh, you know, come into contact with people who'd been there and were really messed up. So that also gave me some stuff to work with as a writer. Um, I had another question for Chris. So, but from Nancy up to Greta Gerwig just recently, you've worked with some of these amazing, amazing female filmmakers. Do you find that when you work with women directors, it, you find different shades in the performances? I, I think you've explored masculinity in such fascinating ways with so many different characters in your career. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that with working with women as a director versus male directors in kind of your process, um, if you had any thoughts on that. Sure, sure. Um, I'm I'm realizing now that you know this is this has come about. I'm re reminded that the first woman, the first film I worked with was with Nancy Savoka. Oh wow! When she was a junior at NYU, my wife did Nancy's half hour black and white sound sync piece they became friends marianne and i did nancy's senior color half hour uh script and nancy was the first female apparently that i that i know of that that won the this score that scorsese always mentions this haig manugian award uh nancy I got two Nancys. The first two two women directors I worked with were both Nancys, and now most recently this year, we're having worked with with um, Marielle Heller and Greta Gerwig. Um, just so proud to um, be a part and having worked with them. Totally capable. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what, man, I don't know what the issue is, but, um, you know, I mean, and jumping back, working with, with Nancy and Kenji, I mean, pff, what's the difference? I mean, I, I don't, I don't get it. And I, I never have. Um, I think that it's, it's with all directors, and I mean this, I mean this sincerely. I think the most important thing 
with the actor director is their casting. I know my job is to make it as easy as I can for the director because I realize they have to deal with a thousand questions every day and I don't want to take up their time. So having come from a theater background and having come from working first with John Sayles, who set a great example of what to look in, what to look for in a director. Um, the one thing he taught me on his end was time is money. And you're not going to have a, we're not going to have a lot of time to rehearse. And that's just the case. That's the way it is, believe it or not. We don't have time re to rehearse. Uh, we'll do a little blocking and we'll talk a little bit while the lights are being set up if we have some issues. But um, I've had a great experience working with, with woman directors and, um, and uh, can't wait to do it again. You know. Uh, the next question is from Tammy. Um, Nancy, was there anything you learned while working on cattle ranches that informed you in making the film? Any specific things that you brought to the set from your, your experience? I think that I went to work on the ranch I, because I wanted to prove to myself how tough I was. I, I thought I was tough, but I really wanted to prove it. And, and, um, and I did, and then I needed to believe from then on, I, that, you know, like in making films, I needed to believe I was tough and, you know, and I am. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Linda. Uh, can you talk about the process of restoring and re-releasing the film and how does it feel to have people seeing it again after all these years? Sandra Schulberg, <laughs> if you're out there. <laughs> you know, that, the, a couple of years ago, the, the prints, the 35 millimeter prints that we had, we still had a few, they wouldn't go through a projector because they were so messed up that the, you know, the sprockets couldn't grab the sprocket holes. The video absolutely sucked. It just was horrible, absolutely horrible. <laughs> and Sandra, who we've known forever, she just mm -hmm. convinced us that, um, you know, we had to save thousand pieces of gold from i don't know the dustbins of history or something and so i mean actually we're saving it from uh, rotting in my mother's garage that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> i mean that's where the we had the a b rolls and that's where they were um and i was sure when we after we shipped them to new york that sandra was going to call and say they're so messed up from being in kenji's mother's garage that you know we can't do it but no they did and so they scanned each frame, 150,000 or something frames. Mm -hmm. And then, then they sent the files to us and we went to Gary Coates, the, um, the colorist that we have worked with on, I don't know how many films, a lot of them. Um, and then we spent some pretty glorious days in there because, do, Anne, do you remember this? The, when it was like, film you'd be in with the with the color timer and it'd be like you want it lighter or darker you more red <laughs> how about that you know now it's like oh, oh it's geez. amazing what they can do it's like, really yeah the, and the, the 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 restoration is so beautiful i mean it's it's a great story and by the, the way, that restoration, yes. I cried the first time I saw it in the theater <laughs> when I saw it at the Museum of the Moving Image last year. I was crying so hard and we were supposed to go up and do a Q and A or we, they were giving us an award. We were supposed, and Sandra was like carrying me, <laughs> whispering in my ear, you're such a good director. <laughs> Mm. But it was just, you know, it was beautiful when it came out too, you know, but this is, this is miles beyond it. This mm. is just luscious. Yeah. yeah. Kenji had the real, did the dirty work. He did the well, real dirty work. Part of, part of the issue was for me was that the, the negative was damaged during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake oh. in a laboratory in a printer and a splice broke. So the negative folded an accordion together and I always saw that 
in the prints. No one else seemed to see it. There was this white flash. Yes, mm. it was all wrinkled. So um, mm. our negative cutter ironed it out <laughs> and, it, and prints were made, but I always knew that it was there. And so in this restoration, we not only fixed that damaged area, but I, the, the film was filthy. It had white specks of dust everywhere. So I tried to hire a, an assistant to clean it up and no one came forward. It's like, where's the set? I want to be on the set. No, no, this, this, that was 30 years ago. The, the task <laughs> is to take every little white dot and take it out. So I did it myself. I did it over a six week period. So it was uh, 151,000 frames. Hmm. Oh. And he went through it seven times. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You must be so sick of looking at us. Well, the, th the thing is, is that when you say that this is a remastered um, film, I really took that to heart, that that's the promise that the filmmakers are going to give to the viewing audience, that this is restored as if it is the first print ever to be seen in your home theater or the movie theaters. And um, I really wanted it to look pristine. And, and of course the performances are all there. So thank you. Yeah, and the words to, are all we there. We need to change that in the, yes. with the colors. <laughs> well, it's richly uh, rewarded all of us from, the, from your work. So thank you so much because the film looks absolutely stunning. Um, we're about out of time here, but there was one other question several people asked in the chat. You'd mentioned earlier that there was a little contest for the first person to make a, a joke or make the other laugh uh, in a given day, Nancy Kinji. Was there one today you could share? What was the, the first funny thing of the day? What was the joke today? <laughs> we forget them immediately. <laughs> okay. Folks for dinner. Right. Not that a joke. is a joke, actually. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank you all so much for spending the time with us and sharing the film with us. Anything else you'd like to say? Wait, the, the director of photography, nobody wanted to shoot this film. When we were tromping around interviewing people and, um, and they would all just kind of say, you can't make this film on this budget. And, um, and finally, Sarah Green introduced me, who you weren't there. No, I wasn't. Um, to, to Bobby, who didn't even have, like, he hadn't shot a feature yet. He had shot a short and it wasn't done. So he brought a 60 millimeter projector over to Sarah's apartment and he showed me scenes. And, you know, it was kind of like, oh, okay. But then as we were walking out, I think Sarah was probably, probably thinking, oh my God. And Bobby said to me, how do you want to shoot that saloon scene? And, and, I, and I described it to him because what I pictured was not like this giant wide shot. I just pictured Lalu face lit by that lantern, you know? And, and, um, and he was like, oh, I can do that. He was the first person, because that was the, the, like the breaking point for everybody else. And, um, and I, I, I talked about that when he saw, he came to see it at the Museum of the Moving Image last year. He just happened to be in New York for one day. And, and when I when I said that, you know, he said that he could do it, he, he stood up and he said, I didn't know if I could do it. I just wanted the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true well independent said. spirit. Yeah. 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 So I, anyway. He was very, he was so, so wonderful to work with. It, I mean, it was very ingenious what he came up with because I think, wasn't I holding on to the candle and he had a belt or something for me to hold on to to make sure that the distance wasn't, I mean, it, and it looked so amazing. At the time, I had no clue what he was doing, but then the end result was amazing. Everybody was very can do. I mean, when Chris was talking about not, um, you know, working with a director and not um, creating uh, too many barriers for them. I mean, I remember we would rehearse the night before, just to make sure that we had our our act together. Um, Bobby with the candles and, you know, he would always come in with something interesting. Uh, the snow, when it would snow, he would come running to the dressing, get, get out, get another outfit, we're gonna go. And we'd all run to the snow or the rain or whatever weather we needed at the time. So it was just a great environment. It was very can do. 
Well, again, thank you all so much for coming out tonight uh, and joining us. Thousand Pieces of Gold is running virtually at BAM and other cinemas across the country. So definitely spread the word, send people to Kino now to watch this incredible film. I want to thank you again to all of our guests um, and uh, for sharing the film with us and have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Wonderful to see everybody. Thank you. It's lovely to see you, Anne. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.